Hello. In this uh, short talk today, I will take you to the 19th century Estonia, to the rural world, to the world of folk tales, legends, folk songs. We shall talk about their relationships and we shall also talk about the connections between the two worlds, this world and the other world. And I believe that uh, this topic might be quite suitable for our post Halloween time or the souls visiting time here I guess we know it in Estonia. So let's get started. First a few words about the genre as a concept. If we think about this not as a tool of classification but if we talk about the communication and uh, thought we can see the genre is also a mode of perception, mode of outlook uh, and uh, in this way genres are not uh, isolated, they are not hermetic uh, containers. On the contrary, they are closely connected. If uh, we don't name them, they are unidentified, then they blend in and the genre boundaries are quite uh, uncertain. There is a lot of ambiguity, how to read them, how to understand them questions if we talk about humorous modality or serious modality, if we talk about the belief, uh, fiction or entertainment, uh, these are often open questions. Deborah Kapchan and Pauline Turner-Strong have, have written that genres like utterances are permeable and unruly and they defy uniformity of uh, response. Anyhow, genres are good tools to, to think with and I think uh, it provides us a, a good guide to, to walk through this quite unruly folklore of 19th century in Estonia and we shall use uh, the category of belief narrative as a category that uh, breaks uh, the limits of existing genre systems. It brings together some genres uh, that uh, we usually think of as being distinct like legends myths, uh, oral histories, conspiracy theories, personal memories, etc. And uh, if we talk about uh, belief, uh, it refers to epistemology, to, to knowledge, to truth claims, what we know, what we don't know, certainties, uncertainties. As many other concepts in the humanities, belief uh, has also been critically examined and it has been deconstructed. Rodney Needham in 1972 published his book Belief, Language and Experience where he, he showed that um, belief is not a very useful analytic category to be applied transculturally. It's not a distinct mode of consciousness. It's very difficult to pinpoint the belief. That's something that we, we know from, from folklore. And recently also in folklore studies there have been claims that uh, we should uh, give up the, the concept of belief uh, as it is not relevant to, to folklore. I'm referring to the work of Benjamin Gatling, a recent publication in the Journal of American Folklore where he argued for, for this. Uh, it was a well argued um, uh, paper. I agree with him that uh, we need to think about believing uh, action belief as a process and however we should not give up the concept of belief uh, they, they go together. Marilyn Motz has written in 1998 that the concept of belief is so central to the discipline that it, hard, it is hard to talk about folklore without talking about uh, belief and belief as a concept uh, is also widely used in the study of religion today. I think the study of religion and, and folkloristics are quite uh, close uh, disciplines, especially if we study belief narratives. So Graham Harvey, who has uh, written a wonderful monograph on religion in everyday life, uh, has written about belief and believing as an enactment of belief, belief as, as uh, action, belief as, as practice. So we can also talk about the disbeliefing in, in folklore because belief and, and disbelief uh, go together as we, as we know. And uh, thinking of belief as, as practice, well, storytelling is a major important practice that expresses, transmits uh, and uh, processes belief. 
So uh, let's uh, get to the Estonian folklore now. Here is the summary of the tale type 475. It's uh, from this publication, Estonian Folk Tales, edited by Risto Järve, Mairi Vasik and uh, Kerri Toomeos Orglan. And uh, the, the summary of the tale type is as follows. A soldier becomes the heater of hell's kettle. He has to keep the fire under the kettle burning, but is not allowed to look into the kettle. He disobeys, finds his superiors in the kettle and adds fuel to the fire. Therefore, the devil is satisfied with him, and he gets a sack full of sweepings from the hell's floor as his wages. The man goes to an inn, where the sack turns out to be full of gold. The innkeeper steals the soldier's wages. The angry soldier goes back to hell. He tells the devil about the unjust innkeeper and gets a new sack full of gold. As a punishment, the devil takes the innkeeper to hell or lets the heater of the kettle warn him against ending up in hell. The man lives a rich life with treasure he has earned. So we have this uh, image of a friendly devil here and of course a happy ending that is typical to, to this uh, genre of uh, folk tales. Of course, no surprise, it's a widespread international tale. The index uh, of Hans-Jörg Hutter, last edition of Arne Thompson, index uh, shows that uh, the story was spread uh, all over Europe from north to south, from east to, to west, also in central Europe. And it also belongs to the collection of folk tales of the Grimm brothers, was published under the title uh, Devil's Grimy or Suti Brother, the Stoifel's Russiger Bruder. It appeared in the edition of 1819. Lutz Röhrig has commented upon uh, this um, tale in his wonderful monograph, Folk Tales and Reality, and this is a book uh, that also discusses the relationship between uh, uh, genres, uh, between folk tales and, and legends, and uh, Lutz Röhrig uh, shows how genres define reality in a different way and that there are different kinds of, of realities in folklore. Röhrich uh, has said that this un uncompletely undogmatic tale replaces the devil's demonic reality with a human figure and that it portrays a jestfully distorted view of hell in contrast to the legend. These tales no longer take Christian ideas seriously, showing that folk tale tellers molded the figure of the devil independently even in opposition to the church's version. So we have some debate, uh, some tension here between folklore and, and the clerical doctrines, as Rurik shows. In Estonia, the story has been recorded in 29 versions. The first uh, recording comes from the year 1870 from Saarema, the largest Estonian island, and the last one from 1937. Here you can see the title page of this popular book of folk tales where the, the tale appeared for the first time in 1878. The spread is quite wide. You don't find it, uh, the story only in northwestern Estonia and the most elaborate, most detailed, longest uh, versions um, come from southeastern Estonia from the orthodox corner of Setuma. Let's examine some of the motives. But first, a few words about the devil in folk religion, and of course it's not a uniform figure. First we can talk about the devil as the evil one. He more or less corresponds to the clerical doctrines. Um, then we have this uh, figure of the stupid devil, who can easily be outwitted. We have a uh, large amount of legends, uh, beliefs uh, about uh, different kind of spirits, apparitions, ghosts, uh, and uh, they are brought together under this uh, title of the devil as a kind of umbrella term. The devil can refer to, to, to vague various kind of supernatural apparitions. Then the name of the devil also refers to, to giants, giants of nature sometimes. And we can talk about uh, the social demonization in, in Estonia, it was especially the, the landlord, the superiors, 
who were, were demonized very often identified with the, with the devil so it's a typical appearance uh, the evil one in legends is a gentleman uh, a landlord and in this illustration you can uh, see a strong connection between the devil and and the horse and the devil and, and the witch we shall talk about this connection with horses later in in more detail we we need to think about uh, the figure of the devil in legends in order to to discuss to to make sense of this folk tale and we can see that uh, the the legends and folk tales are related through inversion some motives appear differently than them we find a kind devil in this folk tale differently from the legends where he usually is dangerous the contract that is made between the man and the devil remains valid they don't uh, break it the contract holds and then there are no sanctions followed by this uh, being in the service of the devil differently from the witch trials for example so the man is rewarded and we see the magical transformation sweepings are turned into gold in legends often it's the other way around that if the devil gives money then turns into something worthless worthless like like ashes or, or rotten tree leaves who is the main hero in this uh, story most often he's a soldier an old soldier like uh, in the tale of the grim publication he can also be a poor man a servant a poor tailor in one story exceptionally he's a merchant the typical beginnings are like uh, those there was a man named Hans serving the, the German landlords who were extremely cruel to him or once there lived an extremely poor man who had a great desire to become rich or during the age of serfdom one serf could not withstand heavy beating he went to forest to hide himself so this encounter meeting the devil in the forest is very common forest is a somewhat um, dangerous place in Estonian uh, folklore usually adventures start there it's opposed to to the home circle and uh, this also happens in, in this uh, folk tale everything starts from from meeting the devil in the forest the devil appears as an old man often with a gray hair and beard as a little old man gray man black man landlord a great gentleman Surhara, and uh, in this uh, talk I would like to illustrate this association between the, the, the devil and hell and uh, the, the manor and landlord on the other hand uh, so I brought some photos illustrating them illustrating them the, the world of um, Estonian manors exceptionally the devil also appears as a black dog in this folk tale well in, in legends in beliefs uh, this appearance is quite common not in this folk tale or there are two devils in action two men in gray suits the pact the agreement is oral then the couple man and the, the devil walk to, to hell walk through the, the forest it's a long walk but in a couple of stories the hell is underground so they have to to jump into a well or into a lake and this takes them to to hell most often and that's uh, really in all stories the hill is associated with with manor it is depicted as, as a manor as a nice castle as a beautiful house as a living house sometimes uh, the house is also depicted uh, black or, or dirty the student word must uh, is uh, semantically open it refers to, to both uh, it can be an iron house the everyday life in in hell is quite uh, happy for, for the man the man has good food he drinks beer eats meat and then cakes but sometimes the food is also simple uh, he eats uh, lentil soup uh, fried uh, frogs uh, drinks turkish pepper vodka so there is something infernal about the, the food ways in in hell there are several taboos in this uh, story first it's forbidden to mention the name of God not in all versions but in some it is said and it's typical to early modern med 
uh, early modern demonological treatises and Preston and Crook belief uh, that uh, you can ward off the, the devil, the devil loses its, uh, its power when you mention God or make the sign of the cross. It's also forbidden to wash oneself, to, to cut hair and, and fingernails. Like in the story of the, the Grimm's and Hook Tales, it's forbidden to lift the lid of the kettle, to look into the kettle. The man has to keep the, the kettle burning, but he cannot uh, look inside. Anyhow, he breaks the interdiction, typical to folk tales, of course, and then he sees who's in the pot. If uh, the man is a soldier, then he usually he sees a general, a colonel, a sergeant, but the words are referred to the Russian military service, like, like Borkovnik. And if the man is just a farmhand, a poor man, then he sees his landlord, bailiff, overseer, these uh, people, officials, in the manner whom he has hated so much. Um, and just a typical sentence, there was his own landlord together with his family boiling in the pot. Let's take one example. The soldier stayed for the second year of service, he kept thinking, who knows what is there in the pot, and lifted the lid. He saw Udeva Schilling, Norra Knoring and Halbu Tublas in the pot. Also the former bailiff and overseer were in the pot. He added firewood under the pot as much as there was space there. The pot started to shake, men in the pot started to whimper. The soldier was happy, you devils, now I can take revenge on you for my father. In a moment the grey man, the devil, came there and said, there must be no bullying, put only one log into the fire. So we have this uh, just uh, devil here, but what is more remarkable, it's the identification of the, the landlords. These are real people, people whom the storytellers knew from everyday life who are uh, depicted in, in, in hell. And it's also remarkable, you see, uh, the soldier appears here, however, the persons in the, in the pot are not uh, his military superiors, they are the, the landlords. So uh, this uh, social contrast, this conflict was, was so strong that uh, the nobility is, is coming into these this stories in the, in the versions where you would not expect that they are, they are there. These are typical examples of legendary discourse in, in Estonia. And uh, in the illustration, you, you see the image of, of hell in, in folk beliefs, in demonological doctrines, and, but in the folk tale, the situation is, is contrary. It is the man who is uh, boiling the, the kettle, and his uh, landlords, the, the evil ones, often identified with the devil, are in the, in the kettle. And the, the devil in this uh, story appears as a kind and nice um, gentleman. So, another inversion. Just to show you how these manners look like uh, today, Udeva, Albu and Norra manor all in the same Yarvama county where the story comes from. And let's take another example. The man had a great desire to look into the cauldron. He could not control himself and so he did. He saw his own landlord in the cauldron, who wanted to get out and begged for help. The man grabbed the finger of the landlord and pulled him. Clop! The skin came off the finger, the landlord stayed in the cauldron and could not escape. A year passed and the man had again a great desire to look into the cauldron. So he looked in and saw the overseer of his manor, who desperately tried to get out. He begged the man to help him. The man helped him and grabbed the hair of the overseer, but the scalp came off and the overseer fell back into the cauldron. After three years, the man went back home. He heard that the landlord had lost skin from one finger. He went to the manor and put the skin back. He was well paid by the landlord. The man also heard that the overseer had lost skin from his head. Again, he went to the manor and put the scalp back. The overseer also paid him well. So that's the start of the happy ending in this story, how, how the, the man gets his, uh, his property, the, the payment uh, from the landlord, from, from the overseer. But uh, what is uh, really remarkable here is this chronotope, the, the time space in this uh, story. We 
we see that there are the parallel worlds, this world and uh, the, the, the hell, they, they coexist, uh, uh, future and the present, they, they merge into one time, so it's a kind of eternal time of the eschatological visions, something that we also find in the sermons, in the visions of Estonian folk prophets of the 19th century, who were called Taevakeyet, the, the heaven goers, who gave vivid descriptions of hell, and they also described their own landlords and superiors burning in, in hell. So everyday life uh, and uh, the, the future of damnation, that they come together. So we see how this uh, poetic uh, uh, genres, um, how poetic genres uh, can inspire the, the myth mystical thinking and uh, visions. In some stories, the, the man has also other duties and in hell he has to work with the horses. One example, one, one passage. The grey man told to the man, you work will be to bring firewood to these stoves every day. In the stable you can find a white horse, work with this horse, but never hit his head and never give food to him, otherwise I won't pay you your salary. The man started to work with the white horse and carried firewood to the cauldrons. One day the load of firewood, firewood was so heavy that the horse could not move. The man started to, to beat the, the horse and accidentally hit his head. The horse started to talk. If you get to the earth again, tell your landlord that your father is sending greetings to him. He's a horse in hell and has to carry firewood. Don't be cruel to your presence. I was cruel and now I am in hell. So we have this uh, didactic uh, message in this story. And uh, in another version, the same happens. The, the horse uh, turns into a human being, a landlord with a, with a big fat belly, and the landlord even writes a letter, a note to the man to, to bring to his son. His, and uh, this would be the way how to prove that uh, the man surf from, surf from the, uh, the manor is not lying. It's an evidence from, from the hell otherwise it would be a terrible insult and uh, the landlord in the other you know, folk tale also changes his mind and, and becomes a very kind and benevolent uh, landlord. But here we also uh, see another folk tale type uh, coming in, it's blended into this uh, tale type number 761, the cruel rich man as a devil's horse, uh, but even more there is a connection to, to legends and to, to beliefs because very often in Estonian beliefs it was the landlords who turned into the devil's horses. We take an example. There was a man near Pulksama who was a soldier in Tsarist times. When he was released from the service he started to come home. He had to walk along a forest path for about three kilometers before he reached his home. The path was in extremely bad condition. The man cursed and swore that the path is so bad and that you have to labor yourself through it. As soon as he had said that, he saw a coach that was pulled by coal black stallions behind him. A coal black man sat in the coach. The man offered him a lift, and since the path was so bad, the soldier thought, why not? The black man offered him a cigarette, but the soldier was not a smoker. And uh, the black man put the box, box back into his pocket. The man began to explain that one of the horses pulling the coach was the Baron of Sigavera estate the second one the Count of Holliste estate, and the third the Provost of Yugava estate. Hearing that, one of the black horses scraped the ground and neighed so loud that the, the forest echoed back. And the black man went on to say that he was going to the tavern in Pultsama to buy a stallion. The soldier jumped off the coach near the path, path which took him home, but the next day it was rumored that the tavern keeper had hanged himself and become the devil's stallion. There are some intertextual links between this uh, uh, legend and, uh, and the folk tales. So we see the, the soldier, the same main hero, also the innkeeper from the folk tale appears here as a negative character who becomes uh, the horse of the, 
uh, the devil, but again, it's more remarkable that uh, the, the landlords have been identified. Some of these place names uh, are imaginary. It is the school boy has um, invented some place names, it, it looks like, but some places are, are real. So the story is uh, connected to the everyday life, the, the social environment of the, the people. There is another Estonian legend type about uh, the, the devil's horses as the devil comes to the smithy and asks the blacksmith to shoe his horse and then the blacksmith uh, sees that the, the legs of horses, the, the feet are actually human feet so it is a scary scene and, and often also in the stories the, uh, the horse of the devil is identified as a, as a former landlord from the neighborhood. So in migratory religions, in international beliefs, uh, there are different ideas who are the sinners who turn into the horses. Sometimes it's a suicide or a drunkard or a lover of, of the priest in Estonia. The, the connection is strong with, with landlords, with, with places, with, with individuals. Uh, we can ask a question about beliefs here. Do these legends discuss beliefs about the afterlife? Or something else. It is true that um, spirits and also the devil very often appear as um, animals, including um, the horses, but uh, I would not say that it was a common belief that uh, the landlords or human beings really turn into horses, into live, uh, real, tangible animals to, to, to serve the, uh, the devil. Rather, we're talking here about morals, about the, the Christian values. That's the main message. But uh, it's difficult to say. We can also talk about the narrative potential of evoking beliefs, of creating serious uh, attitudes, and we are talking about the flexibility and adaptability of the narratives, how they go well together with the, with the social world, how the story uh, world and uh, social reality, how they, they merge together. Now, finally, I would uh, like to return to this idea of manor as a hill that is so common in this folk tale, and we find it often in Estonian songs. One of the first uh, Estonian folk songs that was published was uh, in the 1779 edition of Folks leader published by Johann Gottfried von von Herder, and here is just a passage from the song. There is no Estonian version, but we have this uh, translation by Guntis Nietzsche's. If I can flee from the manor, I will run away from hell. I'll escape from the jaws of the wolf. I'll escape the throat of the lion, from the sharp back teeth of the pike, from the bite of a spotted dog, from the bite of the black dog. And uh, just uh, an illustration from Middle Ages and also in early modern. At times uh, we, we often find these uh, pictures of, of hell, the, the jaws of, of hell, uh, and also the depiction of hell as a castle, as a manor that we find in, in Estonian folk songs and also in this tale type. Or another illustration uh, from medieval drama, medieval theatre, where the stage was often set uh, as you can see from from here on one side uh, we, we see the heaven, the paradise and the other end of the stage simultaneous uh, for simultaneous action we will find uh, the hell again, this uh, jaws of, of hell that you find in Estonian songs and also the, the castle, the, the manor and the, the burning castle, it's also an image that, that is there in, in Estonian folk songs. Let's take uh, one more example En näe, kus paistab põrgu linna, kuradi kodu näikse, siin ta vallid valgendavad, siin ta harjad haljendavad, iga päev siin peksetakse, liha kilda lõigatakse, toobil verda mõõdetakse, saksal süüa annet saadetakse, junkrul juua annetakse, kupja keelta kastetakse, aidame hambaid võietakse. So the, the landlord and the devil identified. It's a landlord, but also the devil who is drinking uh, blood, eating flesh uh, and uh, the work at that manners could be quite uh, harsh. 
there was uh, violence, uh, beating, uh, the discipline was was very strict, uh, so who, the, the peasants were, were not definitely happy about uh, the life at the, at the manor, and, and this uh, appears in these uh, images of uh, folk songs. In these uh, songs, in Estonian beliefs, we can talk about the diabolization of human, of real landlords. In the folk tale, it's the opposite. We can talk about the humanization of the of the devil. The devil is a, is a kind figure. And uh, finally, briefly, I only mentioned that uh, there was uh, this uh, textual tradition of clerical books, uh, hymnals, pictures that were, were printed, that circulated, pictures of, of the devil, of, of hell. Here is an example from late 19th century Estonia and uh, an example of one song about uh, the pains in, in hell, a visionary, powerful song in 18 stanzas that uh, gives a very dramatic, really painful description of, of the punishments for, for different kind of, of sins. It is time to draw the conclusions. So uh, what was uh, this talk about? We were talking about uh, one folk tale, how to, to see the, the connections between this tale type and other genres, beliefs, legends, folk songs. So the, the phenomenological variation, if we take only this uh, tale type, uh, it's quite rich. There was no time to, to discuss all the motives here. There is a lot of diversity of the motives. But if we step out from this tale type to, to study the other, other genres, then, then the world of beliefs really starts to open open up. Uh, we see this transgeneric circulation of motives, mental images. And we, we see how genres uh, relate to each other, how they, they interact. We see how this uh, coherent uh, worldview is, is built um, up uh, in the cooperation of genres, but we also see the inversion of motives. Sometimes the beliefs don't go well together. There is this junctions in beliefs. There are contradictions. And we can talk about the division of labor among genres. Lauri Hongo has written about this, how they, they carry different messages, but still they have one function of building up the, the, the worldviews, the, the mental and social realities. And uh, finally, I just say that uh, belief narrative as a, as a concept, as a tool for thinking, seems quite uh, useful for me, especially if we want to approach this uh, trans-generic dimension of folklore. We want to see how, how different genres work together. Thank you. And uh, finally, just some references.